It is a question playing out on college campuses across the country. When it comes to free speech, are conservative students held to a different standard than their liberal counterparts? Amna Nawaz begins our coverage. With a stroke of the pen, President Trump issued an ultimatum to U.S. colleges. Universities that want taxpayer dollars should promote free speech, not silence free speech. The executive order signed today requires colleges to certify that their policies support free speech as a condition to receiving federal research grants. It does not affect schools' access to federal financial aid for student tuition. President Trump first proposed the idea to a gathering of conservatives in Washington earlier this month. We believe in free speech, including online and including on campus. He brought on stage conservative activist Hayden Williams. They want our dollars, and we give it to them by the billions. They've got to allow people like Hayden and many other great young people and old people to speak. In February, Williams was recruiting on UC Berkeley's campus when he got into an altercation with this man, who then punched Williams in the face. That man was arrested and charged with assault, and the university condemned the attack. Williams spoke to the news hour while in Washington earlier this month. Well, I, I think there's a culture uh, on college campuses that sort of promotes um, one side over the other. And, uh, you know, conservatives are, are in the minority uh, on, on college campuses across the country. But the incident reignited the campus free speech debate with a focus on conservative voices. In 2017, UC Berkeley saw a series of protests after conservative voices, some controversial, like Milo Yiannopoulos, Ann Coulter, and Ben Shapiro, scheduled campus events. Many of the events were either postponed or canceled. That October, UC system president Janet Napolitano told MSNBC free speech is an essential part of its core principles. I think that we have to do a much better job of educating our young people about what the First Amendment protects, what it means, uh, and how once you start restricting speech, you are on a slippery slope. And so we are, we are educators, and that should be part of our mission. Even some in the president's own cabinet, like Education Secretary Betsy DeVos, have argued against federal intervention. And the way to remedy this threat to intellectual freedom on campuses is not accomplished with government muscle. A solution won't come from defunding an institution of learning or merely getting the words of a campus policy exactly right. Today, the Trump administration says it will be holding universities to that mission. Officials say implementation details will be out in the coming months. Let's further explore now the state of free speech on college campuses with Jerry Falwell, Jr. He's the president of Liberty University and was at the White House today as President Trump signed this executive order. And Sanford Unger. He's the director of the Free Speech Project at Georgetown University and the president emeritus of Goucher College. Welcome to you both. Thank you for Thank being you here. Thank you so much. Sandy, I want to start with you. At your project, you and your team document incidents of free speech being restricted. You wrote in an opinion piece, there's an epidemic of challenges to free and open expression. Uh, do you support what the president did today? I do not think that what the president did today has any particular meaning at all, Amna. Uh, we, at our Free Speech Project at Georgetown, are examining incidents where free, free expression is challenged around the country in several different categories. We've got more than 200 of them now on our online tracker. And what we find is that speech is challenged across the political spectrum. This image, the stereotype, the cliché, that it's primarily noble conservative thought that's being challenged by crazy, fanatical liberal students and professors just doesn't bear out. The facts don't support it. It's, it's been, there are many instances where conservative speech is challenged and they get a lot of attention. Some of the people that were in your uh, piece are well known. They go, they expect disruption, they, they encourage disruption and they get it. But a lot of the disruption of other kinds of speech, mainstream speech, factual speech, liberal speech on campuses, is it's disrupted and it doesn't attract the same kind of attention, doesn't have the sort of lobbying force behind it. So I don't think the president, I, I would like to believe that the president wants to protect all speech 
on campus. Chair sure, Falwell, let me ask you about that now because yes. uh, you're speaking from a conservative perspective here. Do you think conservative voices uh, are not supported? Are they banned more? I think former New York City Mike, um, Bloomberg in his commencement speech at Harvard a few years ago said it best when he said the faculty and staff at Ivy League schools, 96% of them donated to the Obama campaign. And so it's, it's, it can't be argued that the vast majority of the faculty and staff at most major elitist universities are one-sided in, in their viewpoints, and it's the liberal side. And so how that translates into whether or not they allow free speech, you hear examples all the time of how conservative, conservative ideas are just not given the same respect that liberal ideas are given. Well, we hear examples all the time, but yep. you heard what Sandy just have to say. Is it, are, are we just talking about them more because they get more attention? I just don't see how 96% or on one I, side I, and could be fair. You know, I'm, I'm not sure that's a meaningful statistic. And, and besides, what is the remedy if you have a lot of professors on campuses sympathetic with Democrats or giving to Democratic causes? What, first of all, I'm, I'm not well, sure. Well, Mayor I, Bloomberg was I understand. He was chastised. Well, whether it's Mayor Bloomberg or anyone else, I yeah. don't, uh, he has no special credibility on this matter. Um, how, how would you suggest, I mean, well, let Paul, me ask you this, running. if you don't mind. Jerry Falwell, Jr., let yeah. me ask you this. In, in the president's expression today, it, it, the idea is that all free speech will be protected. Do you believe that everyone should be granted a platform yes, on university tomorrow, campuses? Yes, tomorrow, uh, Alan Dershowitz is our speaker for our convocation. We have two a week for 10,000 students uh, that attend that particular event. And he um, he's just one example. Jimmy Carter was our commencement speaker. Um, Bernie Sanders spoke at Liberty and was given the utmost of respect by the students. Well, Even most students didn't, didn't agree with him. That's the way it ought to be. There ought to be ideological diversity sure. on campus. When I was president of a small liberal arts college <clears> in Baltimore, <throat> I made it a point to invite speakers from across the political spectrum. And of course we should do that. And I don't favor uh, shouting down any speakers. But my point is just that uh, there is not just a problem on one side. If you listen to it with both ears open and both, and you watch it with both eyes open, there's a problem across the political spectrum. Well, let me, let me put this you. question to you. Let me put this question to you, Sandy, if you don't mind. The, the, it's, it's true that conservative students are an ideological minority on most that university campuses. That is probably campuses. true. Is yes. it incumbent upon university systems to then make sure the rights of that minority, including free speech, are protected? Of course. Oh, of course we should protect the the free speech rights of all students on campuses. I think we deal too much, though, in stereotypes and cliches. First of all, I don't think all of us, students, faculty, staff, <laughs> citizens, should be compelled to reveal whether we're on one side or the other. It, it, it's much more complicated than that. And I think students, when, when you have discussions with students, I teach now at two universities, and when you have conversations with students, you discover that their views are not so easily pigeonholed when you spend meaningful time with them. Everyone comes to college with a different understanding of just what free speech means and with very individual impressions. And I think it's uh, ridiculous to try to categorize, well, what percentage? How do we find that out? I mean, well, do let we me take, ask you take about a survey? That idea of free speech, a lot of this is definition, right? The argument being that when free speech goes into hate speech or discriminatory speech, that that should not be given a platform. ID, uh, for example, a lot of the ideas that may be held by some conservative speakers who've been shouted down before are bigoted towards gay Americans or trans Americans or uh, Americans That's why of a other First things. Amendment. Who decides what's hate speech and what's not? I mean, and when you have 96% of one persuasion making that decision, then it's going to come down lopsided well, you, you go back to that statistic yeah. again, but mm -hmm. as, as someone who's in charge of seeing who gets a platform and who doesn't, where mm -hmm. do you draw the line? We invite a lot of liberal speakers who won't come because they know that Liberty is a conservative school. You don't have to be a conservative to attend Liberty, just like you don't have to be a liberal to attend Harvard. What well, do you think but, that they... Well, of course not. I mean, I teach at <laughs> Harvard, and students are not categorizable like that. Mm -hmm. Certainly in, in my seminars on free speech at Harvard, I would say there's no way to predict the political. These are stereotypes. Students, These students, are names. No, students, a lot of them haven't developed their political Well, and that's a good thing. Yet. That's a good because, thing. Because I know when I was in college, I was worried about what job I was going to get, who I was going to marry, 
you know, everything except politics. You know, the older guys with the ties were the ones that made the decisions anyway. So, so thought, now you're uh, one of the older guys with the ties. Right. Let me ask. Let me ask this of both of you then. As the person who makes some of these decisions, how do you enforce something like this? Where is the line between free speech and something that could be potentially dangerous to some of your student well, body? Well, the exec executive order curbs research dollars to, to our universities who don't permit free speech, and I don't know how you define that and how you how you police it, but. I think the bigger problem is the federal student loan issue, and that's what that's what was discussed today. I think the um, president is going to step further very soon, and is going to try to single out the bad actors who have gone out of business, who have not given their stud students the education they promised. You see, the, the um, before 2010, it was guaranteed, guaranteed student loans. The, private lenders were making the loans, the government was guaranteeing it. Well, so the private lenders were making the profit. Then the government took over. Since they were guaranteeing it anyway, I think they should have been, they should have taken it over. You think it, by the president tying this to financial means in some way, it, it, yeah. it, well, it sense, but, has but a sense of urgency to it. The government should earn the interest income because We don't have much risk. more than a minute oh, left. Oh, okay. I want to make sure respect, we can get into this. One of, the Go government, ahead. one of the president's claims is that universities that don't respect free speech in his terms. We don't know what those terms are. Who will decide? Who will make up the list? Whether it be him staying up late at night or, or some other process than that, that people will be denied research funds. And my only fear about this, I think in general the executive order won't have much effect, but my worry is that ultimately important cancer research could be defunded because somebody offends Milo Yiannopoulos the, who, yeah, but see, the, the bigger problem with colleges, we've got about 30 seconds left. Do you share that concern? Campus. Do they, you share that concern? Colleges don't operate like businesses. We operate like a business. We, we, our students leave with six thousand dollars less debt on that than the national well, average. But that's not. And so there's a, we have a lower our, our, our default rates lower than the national average. The elite schools don't want to operate like businesses. Setting aside the finances for yeah. a moment, though, we're yeah. here to talk about free speech. Are mm -hmm. you concerned that over policing that language could lead to other things happening at I the university? I think just allowing free speech. You don't police. Well, well, sure, but the president is threatening research funding. He has mm -hmm. said it. Mm -hmm. He has used that term. I'd like more definition of what are the grounds for cutting off important research, patriotic research, research to keep Americans safe, healthy, secure for the future because a speaker was shouted down at a campus? That's, a speaker that's was disinvited one. because well, students... Uh, that would be a reason to and cut off the research? And this debate is surely going to yes. continue, gentlemen. We're going to have to leave it there, but I Why thank not? you both very much for mm -hmm. being here. Jerry thank Falwell, you. Jr., mm -hmm. Sanford Unger. Thank you. Thank you.